It's really great to be here on behalf of the American Heart Association speaking to you about the latest in treatment beyond cholesterol and statins. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about the REDUCE IT trial. And I'm really honored to be able to do that. I don't know how many of you have been involved in randomized clinical trials. I've been involved in a lot of them through the years. You know, here we took over 8,000 patients uh, up to seven years or so that we followed these patients patients from around the world, investigators, physicians, nurses, researchers from around the world, a lot of effort going into this, and then the patients themselves. And then a day comes when you get to see the results, and I saw the results for the first time of this trial, and it was humbling to be part of that. So let me review with you a little bit about what the REDUCE-IT trial showed. Before getting started, I just want to uh, share with you relevant disclosures to this talk. I do receive research funding from Ameren. They are the company that makes icosapentaethyl. Uh, that research funding goes to Brigham and Women's Hospital on behalf of the research that I've done on that trial as the study chair and the study's principal investigator. Uh, as well, icosapentaethyl, the drug I'll be describing, which was studied in Reduce It, is approved for use in the United States for triglycerides greater than or equal to 500 milligrams per deciliter. The indication I'm going to be discussing, cardiovascular prevention, would be an off-label use of the drug. So let's go ahead and get started. First, before talking about any drug, I've got to talk a bit about lifestyle. It is the American Heart Association, after all, and lifestyle is big. And when we're talking about risk factors for cardiovascular disease, things like elevated cholesterol or going beyond elevated cholesterol to things like elevated triglycerides, their lifestyle matters a lot. Diet matters a lot. And the best diet is a plant-based diet. There's really nothing that beats that, a diet that's high in fruits, high in vegetables, high in whole grains. Beyond that, regular physical exercise is important and weight control is important. Elevated weight, elevated body mass index, these are things that tend to be associated with high triglycerides. So for people that want to do things the natural way, I'm all for that. Diet and exercise and weight control are the way to go. Now when that doesn't work, uh, then we've got to think about other approaches pharmacological approaches. Uh, let me talk a little bit about triglycerides. Some of the science shows us that triglycerides are a causal risk factor. That is, they're not just associated with disease. Bad levels are high. They're associated with high risk. But they're also causally related. That is, they actually cause plaque buildup in the arteries, just like cholesterol does. And uh, the seesaw, the balance, is really switched at this point, And the weight of evidence is in triglycerides are bad for you. Now, icosapentethyl is the drug that we studied in the REDUCE IT trial, but it didn't just come out of the blue. It had been studied in two other trials before, one called Marine, one called Anchor. And these two trials studied icosapentethyl for triglyceride reduction, and it was found to be very useful for that purpose. It significantly reduced triglycerides that were elevated. And as I mentioned before, it was approved in the U.S. for use for triglycerides greater than or equal to 500 milligrams per deciliter. The reason for that is to try to prevent pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas gland, uh, that can occur when the triglycerides are super high. But then came Reduce It, and that was not a trial to look at triglyceride reduction because we already knew icosapentethyl reduced triglycerides. We wanted to see, does it reduce cardiovascular risk? So that was the purpose of the Reduce It trial. So we took 8,000 patients from around the world, actually a bit over 8,000 patients from around the world, folks who consented to be in this trial, obviously. Uh, these were uh, men and women, uh, age 45 years or greater, who either had established cardiovascular disease, by that I mean plaque in their heart arteries, their brain, brain arteries, their leg arteries, somewhere in their body there is plaque, uh, or they had diabetes plus at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor. So. You could say secondary prevention and high-risk primary prevention. So that's the population that comes in. Everybody had to be on a statin to lower their cholesterol for at least the past month in a stable dose. And they had to have a cholesterol within the range between 40 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. So well-controlled LDL cholesterol, even by contemporary standards. And then they also had to have triglycerides somewhere between about 135 to 500 milligrams per deciliter. I hedge a little bit on the exact value because, as you know, triglycerides fluctuate a lot. 
can depend on their diet, what you had last night to eat, uh, when the blood's taken, so a, a little bit of, of a range. But ultimately, we enrolled patients that had triglycerides of about 100 milligrams per deciliter or so to a little over 500 milligrams per deciliter. So that's the basic trial population. Then patients were randomly assigned to either four grams a day of icosapentethyl or to a matching placebo. And then they were followed for several years, an average of 4.9 years. So you could say an average of five years. So that's the basic trial. We followed patients to see what happened to them in terms of important events like cardiovascular death, heart attack, stroke, getting hospitalized for chest pain, or getting a revascularization procedure. I mean things like stents and bypass surgery. So that was the so-called primary endpoint. That's what we were looking at. Here are the results, and I'm really excited to share them with you. So over the course of that about five years or so, we saw a significant reduction in ischemic event rates, rates of heart attack, stroke, dying from cardiovascular causes, needing procedures like stents or bypass surgery, getting hospitalized for chest pain, reduced from about 28% to 23%. That's a 5% absolute risk reduction, a 25% relative risk reduction, works out to a number needed to treat of only 21. So you only need to treat 21 patients to get one of those benefits with a highly significant p-value. So the secondary endpoint looked at what we sometimes call hard events, dying from cardiovascular causes, heart attack, stroke. The other endpoint included things like needing procedures or getting hospitalized, which are really important and bad, but here now we're focused on things that are super bad. And as it turns out, that event rate was reduced over about five years from 20% to 16%, a 4% absolute risk reduction, a 26% relative risk reduction, a number needed to treat of 28, again, a very low number needed to treat, and once more, highly statistically significant. So large relative and absolute risk reductions favoring icosapentethyl versus placebo. Now, as is often the case with these trials, we looked at lots of different subgroups that we pre-specified ahead of time, and overall, there was a very consistent benefit favoring icosapentethyl versus placebo. This is true in men, it's true in women, it's true in people with diabetes, without diabetes. This was true of the primary endpoint. It was also true of the key secondary endpoint that I just shared with you, the dying from cardiovascular causes, heart attack, stroke endpoint. So, Really um, uh, robust results, consistent in multiple subgroups, true for the primary endpoint in subgroups, true for the secondary endpoint in subgroups, and one that I'm going to call out that I think was particularly interesting, that surprised many folks, was the triglycerides at baseline, less than or greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter, and about 10% or so of the population had trigs below that 150 uh, cut point, and the degree of benefit for icosapentethyl versus placebo was remarkably similar. Now, we looked at a variety of other endpoints. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything that we looked at, but some key things to mention is just as standalone endpoints, there was a significant reduction in heart attack. That was reduced by 31 percent. Stroke was significantly reduced by 28 percent. Hospitalization for chest pain significantly reduced by 32 percent. The need for procedures, either urgently or emergently, like bypass surgery and stents, was reduced by 35%. And perhaps most important and most intriguing was a significant 20% reduction in death from cardiovascular causes. So, you know, that really important endpoint was significantly reduced. Now, that is the conventional way of looking at data, what I've shared with you so far, looking at the time to the first event. So for example, somebody has a heart attack in the trial, we say, okay, they had a heart attack. We keep following that person, but for the trial, they've contributed an endpoint and then they can't contribute anything more. But what we've done in the analysis I'm about to present right now is look at recurrent events and total events. So, of course, someone can have a heart attack, could be a fatal one, in which case they wouldn't show up in this analysis again. But many times after that heart attack, they might have a stroke or they might die from something like a stroke. So there can be other recurrent events that go on. And now what I'm going to show you is that total. The first event, recurrent events, total event. So the first events were reduced by 25%. I already shared that with you. That's what's green in the slide. But then second events were significantly reduced. Third events were significantly reduced. And fourth or more events were significantly reduced, cut in about half or so, such that in total, 31% of the events were prevented. In mathematical terms, 
that is a highly significant finding. The p-value, uh, lots of zeros in there. So very large effect, very significant effect. Large not just in relative terms, but again in absolute terms. This 31% reduction in events, basically the total events in this population of 8,000 patients going down from about 1,700 to 1,100. So a bit more than 500 events prevented. Again, these are things like heart attacks and strokes and dying from cardiovascular causes, important stuff. Now, what I'm showing you is a graphical way of looking at those total events data. Again, as I mentioned, about a 25% reduction in the first event, but then about a 30% reduction in total events. Percentages of patients having events, not just first events, but also recurrent events, then total events, it's a large proportion of patients. So just over the course of five, six, seven years, we see that there are a lot of events occurring. So what this tells me is that this was a high-risk population. And, you know, I might not have made it clear. These weren't people coming in with heart attacks or strokes. These were people that were stable patients in an office, happened to have high triglycerides. Doctor happens to enroll them in a trial with their consent, obviously. They're followed for many years. And these stable people from a doctor's office are having this incredibly high rate of events. And what this teaches us is that in a person who, despite their best efforts with diet, despite being on a good dose of a good statin, still has high triglycerides, that is a high-risk patient. They're at very high risk for having recurrent events. So it's something uh, that I think physicians certainly need to be mindful of. Now, just a few other points I want to make about these data. Uh, this is another way of looking at it. For every 1,000 patients who would be treated with icosapentethyl versus a placebo, 159 cardiovascular events would be prevented. Again, a large number of events, huge public health implications from that. Now, I did mention maybe there's more to the story than just triglyceride reduction. And there's a lot I could go into. I think we'll have a panel discussion where probably there are going to be lots of questions about this. But there are many different theorized effects of EPA or icosapentaenoic acid, which is the omega-3 fatty acid that is the active ingredient in icosapentethyl. And uh, some of these are things like stabilizing the function of the endothelium. Those are the cells that line blood vessels. There have also been some theories that there might be anti-inflammatory effects of icosapent ethyl, and there's also a possibility of direct effects on the plaque. So then just to summarize with you, we have identified and reduced it patients who despite apparent stability, they're comfy, they're sitting in the office, they're happy, but despite that, they've got elevated triglycerides, and this identifies that they are at very high risk for future cardiovascular events. And therefore, I think based on the results of Reduce It, we now have an entirely novel way of reducing that cardiovascular risk. So hopefully I've been able to share with you some of the excitement I have about this new science. I think this is an advance that could really have an enormous impact on things like heart attack, stroke, and dying from those causes. Well, thank you very much for your attention. You've been a wonderful audience, and I really appreciate the American Heart Association helping me get out the message from this important trial. Thank you. Deepak, that was uh, an amazing discussion of, of a really hot area in, in cardiology, and, and there's so much going on now beyond statins, beyond LDL cholesterol in terms of potential to further modify risk. And um, this is a, it's a somewhat new area, right? And we have this, this fascinating dynamic where we now know that over-the-counter fish oil is doesn't really do much in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk. With We're pretty confident about that. And then the exciting results of the uh, Reduce It trial. And Eldrin, can you start off with comments or questions? Yes, well, first of all, I think it's pretty impressive that lowering triglycerides and Reduce It actually made a difference in macrovascular events. And, you know, as you illustrated, across all cardiovascular um, uh, non-fatal events as well as cardiovascular death, you see a consistency in the effect. Right. Um, All-cause death, of course, didn't quite meet statistical significance. Yeah, though there was a trend. But there was a trend, uh, exactly. 0.09, 13% lower. That's right. It's always important to kind of balance the risk versus the benefit. Mm -hmm. And while you see this significant efficacy, as I recall, there was uh, increased risk of atrial fibrillation and um, some bleeding risk. You know, I was wondering a little bit about that. And then also, I thought the interesting design, 
where 30% of the patients didn't have cardiovascular disease, but had diabetes. Yeah, all great questions. Let me start with the atrial fibrillation. So there was about a 1% absolute increase in hospitalization for atrial fibrillation or flutter, an adjudicated pre-specified endpoint that was statistically significant. So to contextualize it, a 1% absolute increase over an average of five years, so pretty small absolute excess. But of course, uh, what we worry about most with atrial fibrillation is stroke. And in the trial overall, there was a significant 28% reduction in stroke, not an increase in stroke. And even in the subgroup of patients with atrial fibrillation, directionally all the results were consistent. That is, directionally consistent uh, effects on stroke, MI, sudden cardiac death. So really all the benefits we saw in the overall trial were also present in the subgroup of patients who developed atrial fibrillation in the trial. So it's something to be aware of. But, you know, I think it needs to be contextualized. I don't think it's that big a deal. As far as the other thing you mentioned, bleeding, there was a significant increase in uh, minor bleeding, but in more severe forms of bleeding, no significant excess. And just to put things, you know, in the 30,000-foot view, overall in this 8,000-plus patient randomized double-blind placebo control trial, overall looking at the rate of significant adverse events, strictly speaking called treatment emergent adverse events, TAEs, uh, the rates were identical in the two treatment arms. So overall in the trial, the drug was tolerated as well as and as safe as a placebo. Norma, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, exciting results. Um, really curious, you know, as, as triglycerides are a risk factor, but it seemed like the benefit of, uh, was, was consistent across all levels and you not necessarily had to have a higher level of triglyceride to see a benefit. Um, so just wondering in terms of the mechanism, you think, uh, in terms of that effect, was it, um, as you said, you know, membrane stabilization or, or something else going on? And does where the curves separate help you in terms of trying to figure out what that mechanism might be? Again, terrific questions. Uh, the uh, benefits are probably in part due to triglycerides, but you're right, at least in the analyses to date, the benefits seem consistent across all baseline levels of triglycerides. And about 10% of the population had triglycerides between 100 and 150 milligrams per deciliter, and the rest was mostly between 150 and 500. But the benefits in relative terms seem pretty consistent. Now, the absolute risk of events, cardiovascular events, went up with triglyceride levels. So triglycerides are a potent risk marker, and the higher the triglycerides, the higher the absolute risks are, and therefore some of the absolute benefits were larger when baseline levels of triglycerides were higher. But it was a consistent benefit, and it does argue that there's probably more going on to the story here than just triglyceride reduction, and probably icosapentethyl is working on other pathways, maybe quieting down some pro-inflammatory pathways in atherosclerosis, may be leading to plaque stabilization. We know there's some sort of antithrombotic effect because yes, there was an increase in minor bleeding, but that might account for some proportion of the benefit. We saw a very uh, small but statistically significant difference in blood pressure in favor of icosapentethyl, <laughs> uh, both uh, systolic and diastolic. So I think there are probably multiple mechanisms at play. You alluded to one very interesting one having to do with cell membranes, and there's great basic science work that looks at cell membrane preparations and shows differing effects of EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid, uh, which is what is in uh, eicosapentethyl, and DHA, another omega-3 fatty acid. And it appears that EPA integrates into cell membranes in ways that are stabilizing, whereas DHA, not so much. So that might account for, in our trial, we saw a significant, almost a 50% reduction in sudden cardiac death. And uh, maybe that had to do with some cell membrane stabilization. And it is also the case, you mentioned the consistency in triglyceride subgroups. I didn't actually answer the other part of your question, Eldrin, where you said that, you know, our primary prevention and secondary prevention cohorts, there seemed to be consistent benefits. So while, of course, the primary prevention patients had lower absolute risk than the secondary prevention, I think the key re uh, risk marker that we've identified here is triglyceride elevation. So despite diet, despite statins at a good dose, these people still had high triglyceride levels, and that really, even though they're stable outpatients, it really does point to residual risk beyond cholesterol lowering, something we've identified that's not only now a marker of risk, but a target for therapy. So you point out, Deepak, that these patients were all on, on um, high-dose statin, or at least reasonable-dose statin. Yeah, LDL, you know, an average of a little over 70. And we know um, that... Um, uh, that, that even patients with established atherosclerotic disease, that this JAMA cardiology manuscript, for example, that Chris Cannon um, led, showed that only 53% of patients with atherosclerotic disease 
were on um, a statin. So Amelia, what, what, tell us about your perspective on, on how we address kind of the broad issues of um, using these effective treatments for lipid management. So that, that's an excellent question. And, and, you know, on the one hand, this is potentially a game changer in terms of therapy. But given that we know that, you know, half of people aren't on statins after one year, how is this not going to be deja vu all over again? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, first of all, you know, there's been an independent cost effectiveness analysis done, and it's shown that the drug's highly cost effective. So I do think in terms of access, that will be quite good. Uh, in terms of tolerability, it was tolerated overall in the trial as well as a placebo. So, you know, with statins, of course, there's concerns about all sorts of side effects. Now, in the randomized trials, maybe the side effects haven't been quite so bad, but, you know, it, it's sort of out there on the Internet that statins cause all sorts of bad things, and I think that's part of the reason, you know, the patients uh, in general uh, come off them at pretty high rates. You know, here I think it has the advantage, though this is a prescription drug, icosapendethyl we're talking about, it's ultimately derived from nature. Uh, from, you know, fish. So I think the fact that it's natural might actually help patients stay adherent to it as opposed to just a, you know, plain old drug where a lot of times people don't like it. It is a prescription drug, but it's derived from natural sources. So maybe that'll help patients stay on it, whereas, you know, statins, they just, many times patients' view is just, you know, big evil drug companies that produce them. They don't want to take them, even though they're generic and cheap and highly effective. But could there be an unintended consequence because we know that statins really save lives, and yours was done in the context of people being on statins. So do you worry that perhaps people could say, oh, okay, I'm going to take my fish oil or et cetera, well, instead of being I, on the statins? Yeah, I mean, I'd be first of all clear with them that it's not official, that it's a you know prescription right. medicine, and that the supplements really, there's no evidence that they provide cardiovascular benefit. They're a waste of money, really, I No, would but say. in terms of taking th your medication. Oh, sure, no, no, I get it. Might they take that and say, forget the statin. Exactly. Pretty yeah. good. Exactly. And, you know, I, I think uh, there's always risk that patients might not take other medicines when we add new ones, right? right? That's part of the problem, stacking therapies. But I think there it's a matter of communication. But, you know, I, I, I think it really has to do with approaching cardiovascular risk reduction in a multi faceted way. You know, it's not just focusing just on the cholesterol or just on the triglycerides. It's got to be everything integrated. Mm -hmm. So, Gray, as a leader of a health system, how do you consider here, here we have a treatment and um, that, that's still going through its full regulatory review and, and, and whatnot, but, but, but the results are very impressive of this trial. Um, but it's not cheap, and it's, um, and it's on top of other um, much less expensive treatments that we don't use as well as we should. Right. How do you think about this? Well, I think a, a couple of ways. I, th I think, um, <clears throat> number one, the results are impressive. Um, number two, I, I think the emphasis on adherence to best practice, and here best practice would be diet, exercise, and continuing statins. Um, I think I'd be interested, uh, as I think through this through, um, in terms of the number of patients who would be eligible uh, for this uh, unique therapy, uh, who are already at risk, who already are on statins. Uh, and it seems that the uh, degree of elevation of triglycerides is not astronomical in terms of the requirement at all. Would you say that 50% of patients might be eligible for this intervention uh, who are at risk for cardiovascular disease? Would it be higher or lower than that? Because that's a way to think about it. I think it really depends on the population sure. uh, that you're talking about. But so far, what's been published yeah. in terms of generalizability has ranged from a low of 15% to a high of 50%. Yes. And you know, the truth is somewhere in between. But again, it'll depend on the populations. Right. But I, I think the important uh, thing to do now is just like most patients, at least uh, really uh, medically savvy patients, know their cholesterol. Probably none of you can go to a cocktail party without some patient coming up saying, hey, this is my cholesterol, what do you think? I, I, now we've got to get patients to pay attention to their triglycerides in the same way. And that's not to say all of them need to be on prescription icosapentethyl. A proportion of them, I think, should be. Yeah. But at least emphasizing things like diet. And, and diet can be really important, you know, plant-based diet in particular. Statins is a second-line therapy after diet for high triglycerides. So there's a lot we can do that it's actionable. Yeah. And I guess I'd also think about it. I know this particular trial was done out of physicians' offices, but being a get with the guidelines person, uh, is there an opportunity as in terms of secondary prevention when a patient's come in, uh, as Greg Fonro talks about that teachable moment, I'm wondering if application at that point, uh, when the patient's about to be discharged with appropriate education, appropriate follow-up, 
might be an opportunity that is uh, that presents itself to us in terms of increasing the utilization uh, around a very very high risk group. So your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a terrific thought. There's nothing about the drug that confines it to outpatient yeah. use. In fact, I think for from an adherence perspective, a lot of times it's better to start meds for risk reduction in the inpatient phase yeah. of care. Someone's just had a heart attack. They're really focused on what yeah. might they be able to do. Uh, the only uh, caveat I'd say is you know, probably want to do the other stuff to make sure the triglycerides are optimized. So if the person's come in, bad diet, not on a stent, yeah. probably want to do things in a stepped fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, if just you're starting multiple things at once and then there's side effects, sometimes then the patients stop everything. Right. But, but other than those practical issues in terms of if the patient's otherwise risk optimized and they've come in with an ischemic event or hospitalized mm -hmm. for unstable land or something, I think that's a great patient where you want to intensify their care. So. Right. Yeah, even though I had mentioned uh, in my presentation that we were largely getting outpatients, yeah. there's nothing about the drug that means it can only be used in outpatients. Thank you. Well, thanks for this great discussion. And it's, um, uh, you know, it's an incredibly exciting area that now we have something, well, we have uh, several things and we'll have more beyond statins um, that, are, that are affecting lipids that may have a variety of different actions, but most importantly, that, that, uh, that have the promise to provide substantial additional benefit to reduce um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So thank you, Deepak.